Thank you. So welcome everybody to this medical grand round before the holiday. Um, it is my pleasure today to introduce the 21st endowed memorial lecture for uh, John Cunio and John Richardson. Uh, John Cunio and John Richardson were two unique physicians, pioneer nephrologists in Florida. John Richardson uh, trained uh, at the University of Emory under the mentorship of uh, William Hewlett and Homer Smith. And George Cunio was actually a native from Miami and uh, was part of the second class in the new University of Miami Medical School. And both of them extremely loved by uh, patients and the community. And uh, it is uh, based on this excellent care and presence they had in the community that eventually the family and the National Kidney Foundation of Florida have decided for the establishment of this lectureship. And I want to welcome you today. And, uh, and thanks again, the family, Miss Jane, Mary Grace Richardson uh, for uh, being so supportive and present in all our activities. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Maria Irasabal. Dr. Irasabal completed her medical school and clinical internship in the Universidad de la República in Montevideo, Uruguay. Dr. Irasabal pursued a research fellowship in nephrology and a PhD in biomedical sciences and clinical and translational sciences at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine in Rochester, Minnesota. She then joined the faculty at Mayo Clinic in 2015 and currently serves as an associate professor of medicine in the division of nephrology and hypertension. Dr. Yasawa's research focuses on understanding the pathogenesis and molecular mechanisms of renal injury in autosomal, autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. She has been awarded multiple research grants for her work. Today's presentation is entitled TKV, Metabolites and Beyond, in search of the best biomarkers in autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Yasawa. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is truly an honor to join you today for the Kenya Richardson uh, lectureship. And I hope that one day I will be able to visit in person the University of Miami. So my presentation today will cover some of the clinical challenges in assessing patients with ADPKD at the early stages of the disease. And currently um, uh, some um, tools that we have to assess disease severity and progression. Um, I also will be sharing my journey to identify ideal uh, early biomarkers for patients with the disease. So before moving on, I don't have any relevant financial uh, relationships to disclose, but perhaps um, what I should disclose is that I'm not an apologist. I am a translation research scientist that has been working with uh, specifically polycystic kinesis for the past decade. So uh, I divided the presentation today in three main areas. Um, the two main areas are um, um, intended to provide an introduction to the clinical problem, where I will discuss uh, some of the main features about ADPKD, such as the phenotypic variability and um, the uh, natural course of the disease. And also I will be um, um, sharing some of the available tools that we have uh, nowadays to assess disease severity and progression at early stages of the disease with a focus on total kidney volume and image class. And then during the, uh, the second half of my presentation, I will be uh, focusing mainly on my program's current work, which is focused on understanding the mechanism that contributes to disease development and renal damage and function deterioration with the aim of identifying um, ideal real-time biomarkers of disease severity and progression, but from very early stages of the disease. So as you know, ADPKD is the most common hereditary kidney disease uh, with one in uh, 500 to one in 5,000 uh, died first. And in fact, is the most common monogenic kidney disease. And it uh, constitutes the fourth leading cause of renal failure in the US and almost 3.5 million are uh, spent every year in the care of patients with ADPKD. But still there remain uh, several challenges in several areas of the disease. So um, as uh, you know, it's characterized by progressive development and enlargement of bilateral renal cysts that will compress the renal parenchyma and adjacent structures such as the vasculature will lead to uh, interstitial fibrosis and inflammation and eventually patients will um, um, 
end up having a stage renal failure. In 2019, uh, a major milestone was reached with the uh, FDA first approval of the first treatment for patients with ADPKD, tolvaptan. And um, the problem is that although tolvaptan slows down the, uh, the progression of the disease, it does not cure the disease. And some of the patients also uh, experience aporetic related uh, side effects, and in more rare cases, hepatotoxicity. And it's because of that that uh, we really need additional interventions that can provide hope of disease progression. And uh, we believe that a better understanding of the disease mechanisms will allow the development of more specific and effective therapies. So uh, one interesting fact about uh, autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease that, in my opinion, makes the disease very interesting but also creates several challenges when assessing patients with ADPKD is that patients do present with a very large phenotypic variability. And so we know that this phenotypic variability is to heterogeneity and the gene level, where there are two main genes, PKD1 and PKD2, that are responsible for most of the cases. PKD1 constituting about 80% of the cases and PKD2 approximately the 15 remaining. And uh, we know also that patients that present with a mutation in the PKD1 gene have a more severe clinical presentation compared to patients that present with a mutation in the PKD2 gene. And this is evidence in here. As you can see, we have two patients of the same sex and at the same age. And the patient with a mutation in the PKD1 presents with more severe disease, larger kidney volumes, and higher number of cysts. And on average, patients with a mutation in PKD1 um, develop end stage renal failure approximately 20 years younger um, compared to patients with mutations in the PKD2 gene. But in addition to these uh, genetic heterogeneity, we have also uh, heterogeneity at the allelic level. Um, there are more than a thousand different pathogenic mutations that have been identified already for PKD1 and PKD2 genes. And uh, this is evidence in here. And as you can see, these are, again, there are three cases, the three of the same sex and the three at the same age, the three of them with mutations in the PKD1 gene. But as you can see, the three of them have very different uh, levels of disease severity, ranging from very mild, as you can see here, to more moderate to uh, more severe clinical presentation. But in addition to this uh, genic and allele uh, heterogeneity, we know that there are other modifying factors as we see through um, inter, uh, familiar variability. And in here, this is an example of that where you see two siblings. And uh, in this case, the younger sibling presented with a higher kidney volume at a younger age compared to this other person. So, but why is this important? Well, the importance of this is that it is, uh, we really need to try to identify uh, patients with milder cases because they may not necessarily benefit or require a therapy. And um, also the inclusion of patients with very mild disease into clinical trials decreases the power to detect a treatment effect. Um, another peculiarity of patients with um, ADPKD is uh, the natural course of the disease. So um, as opposed to other renal diseases, patients with ADPKD are born with uh, normal renal function, but it's maintained during several decades until very late stages of the disease until there is a decline in renal function. So at this time, when there is already a decline in renal function, if we use uh, renal function markers to assess the progression or a treatment effect, we, uh, it's very easy to detect changes. However, if we wait until this stage, it may be too late for a treatment effect, or even if it is efficacious, you have less time to have a benefit. So on the other hand, if we want to implement therapies during the very early stages of the disease, it's going to be very difficult to assess the treatment effect or even predict disease progression during these stages because the GFR remains during, um, within normal levels. So uh, thanks to the advancement of uh, the imaging studies and specifically the CRIS study, we now know that in these patients, the kidney volume increases annually. And so uh, it is because of this 
that during very early stages of the disease, PKV has become the best marker that we have so far to evaluate not only a treatment response, but also to be able to predict disease progression. So as I mentioned before, early on, uh, the CRISP study has shown that the total kidney volume in these patients and uh, cyst volumes is, uh, is increasing exponentially at an average rate of 5% per year. And uh, also the total kidney volume at baseline was the best predictor of subsequent rate of increase in the renal volume and a further decline in the renal function. And it's because of this that the total kidney volume is currently used as primary or secondary endpoint in multiple clinical trials. The problem is that um, kidney volumes as performed in the clinical practice are laborious, time consuming, but more importantly, there are um, cases where uh, TKV is not a good predictor of uh, further GFR decline. And these are uh, what we call the um, atypical cases, which are patients that present with focal disease, which are patients that may present with unilateral asymmetric pigmental or loop sided distribution of the disease. But also we have cases that present with parenchymal atrophy that could be either unilateral or bilateral. So in an effort to um, improve the prediction of TKV in these patients, we developed back in uh, 2015 an image classification with the aim of uh, helping the selection of the appropriate patients for clinical trials, but also uh, to be able to identify which are the patients that more likely will benefit from an um, effective therapy. So the main specific aim or the first specific aim for this classification was to ascertain the performance of the people, uh, total kidney volume as calculated by the ellipsoid equation compared to TKB by calculated by the stereology technique, which is the current uh, standard for calculating TKB. And so uh, what we did is in 590 patients from uh, our clinical database and 177 patients from the CRIS study, we calculated the total kidney volume using stereology. And we also calculated total kidney volume using the um, ellipsoid technique that as you can see, you can calculate very easily with these four different measurements. And so what we found was that there was not um, a systematic under or overestimation and that uh, TKV by ellipsoid was a very good predictor of the TKV by stereology technique. And while there, um, it takes about 45 minutes to calculate TKV using the stereology technique, it takes only five to seven minutes to calculate TKV using the ellipsoid equation. So um, our second specific aim for the development of this classification was uh, to develop and validate an image of TKV based simple classification of ADPKV that could be used to ascertain the prognosis of individual patients. So for this, the first step was to uh, divide the patients into what we call uh, typical, which are the ones that present with cyst distribution bilaterally diffuse, where uh, most of the cysts contribute evenly to the TKV. And on the other hand, we have the patients that present with atypical disease that will be the focal ones, either unilateral, segment, uh, asymmetric, segmental, or loop sided, but also the ones that we call 2B that are the ones that present with uh, kidney atrophy. And so uh, here is an example of the typical presentation of ADPKD that constitute approximately 95% of the cases. And as you can see, this could range from very mild to more moderate to severe presentation. And here is again the example of the atypical patients that constitute only about 5% of the patients. And we have the ones that are unilateral, asymmetric, segmental, or lopsided distribution and also again, the ones that present with parenchymal atrophy. And so the idea behind this separation is that um, we know that in these patients, um, in these examples of the atypical ones, total kidney volume was not going to be a good predictor of uh, GFR decline. And um, the, the, the premise behind this is that in these cases, patients are going to have a very large kidney volume they are not necessarily going to have a, um, a deterioration in the renal function 
that would be uh, fast. On the other hand, we have these other patients with the uh, present with atrophy that will have smaller kidney volumes, but that wouldn't necessarily reflect a good kidney function. So with that in mind, uh, the, the, the next part or portion of the classification is based mainly in the typical cases for class one, which are the ones that we know that um, the total kidney volume is going to be a good predictor of uh, GFR decline. So in addition to that, what we wanted to do is we wanted to be able to separate the patients in different classes and be able to predict who is going to predict um, um, who's going to progress faster among the typical patients. So as I mentioned before, we knew that uh, the average um, percent increase in the kidney volume in the first population was 5% per year. So we did want to have patients that will be having a kidney growth rate below that. And so uh, we separate the patients in theoretical kidney growth sites. And we have five different classes ranging from 1A to 1E being A, the ones with the most um, uh, mild presentation compared to 1E that are uh, with the uh, most severe presentation. And so um, the idea behind that is that in order for this patient to have this kidney volume and this other patient to have uh, a much higher kidney volume, but at the same age, this patient has to have a much higher kidney volume growth rate per year in order to achieve this volume at this same age. So um, after that, based on that, we develop a model and we use, uh, instead of using hydrogen TKB in the model to predict functional decline, we use the classes to predict functional decline. And based on that model, we develop an equation that um, we use to predict EG, future EGFR. And so here are the slopes of the uh, model that were derived from the equation from the model. And as you can see, uh, we determined that all the different classes have different rates of disease progression and are different among them, except the patients that uh, are class 1A that are the mildest that were not different compared to from a uh, kidney donor population. So um, this classification is broadly used to uh, be able to decide which patients are the most indicated for therapy, uh, we um, also used to determine uh, approximately the rate of progression of the patients. Uh, and it, it does perform very well at the population level. However, of course, it does have uh, many limitations and it's, it doesn't perform that well at the individual patient level. But uh, more importantly, or in my opinion, uh, one of the main limitations is that it is still based on total kidney volume, which is um, non-specific. And so um, uh, the idea was that we really wanted to try to identify biomarkers that are related to the underlying mechanisms of the disease that could point towards additional mechanisms that we could develop drugs for therapeutic intervention. So uh, my laboratory focused on understanding the pathogenesis and the molecular mechanisms of renal injury in ADPKD. And the main goal is to be able to understand um, what the, make the pathways that are underlying the disease with the goal of identifying biomarkers, but also for uh, developing new therapeutic intervention. And so uh, with that in mind, uh, we know that uh, cyst development in persistent kidney disease is characterized by an imbalance that favors epithelial cell proliferation or apoptosis. And there is also, uh, we know that Process that stimulate renal cell proliferation have the potential to generate the cystic phenotype. And so uh, it is also known that metabolic dysregulations are, um, um, are coming up as crucial features that contribute to the disease and are observed early on. And so those uh, are seem to continue to uh, disease development and progression. And so with that in mind, we started a metabolomics approach to try to identify at different uh, uh, stages of the disease, what are the underlying metabolic pathways that are regulated to try to find additional therapeutic directs and potentially new biomarkers related to the underlying molecular mechanisms of the disease. So the first uh, metabolomic study that we did was in the PCK rat, um, which is a common model of a RPKD, a personal recessive polycystic kinesis, 
And for that, we included 32 PCK rats and uh, 24 spread duly rats that were used as a control. And we divided randomly in two different groups, a group that we treated with uh, synthetic vasopressin and another group that we treated with a uh, saline solution. And the idea behind that was uh, we do really wanted to have different animals with different phenotypes at the same age to mimic as much as possible the phenotype in humans. So what we did in this study, we follow longitudinally these animals from uh, day 10 after birth uh, with a sequential abdominal MRI as we do in humans. We also did a urine collection at day 30. And then we, at, uh, before the euthanasia of these animals, we perform uh, the final MRI and we collected uh, that sample and tissue samples for metabolomics. So here is the example of the abdominal MRI that we did in these animals. And here I am showing on top the animals that um, were treated, the PCK rats that were treated with uh, DDAVP. And in the bottom, these are the PCK animals that were treated with a saline solution. And as you can see from very early stages of the disease, DDAVP administration resulted in um, um, uh, an increase in the number of cysts but also in the kidney volume that was significant compared from the start of uh, the starting of the treatment. But uh, more importantly, what we also wanted to show was that the DDAVP administration in the Spragduli animals that were the controls, it did not generate a cystic phenotype and it also didn't result in an increase in kidney volume other than from the total growth of uh, the animals. So here are the, on top again, the, um, Spragduli animals that were treated with the AVP, and at the bottom, the abdominal MRIs from the animals that were treated with the same solution. So uh, with the tissue extracts, we took a proton LMR approach to do metabolomics, and we were able to confidently identify 57 metabolites in the tissue. And of those, 28 were significantly different among the PCK animals compared to the Spragduli controls. We also did proton NMR in the urine samples that we collected, and we were able to confidently identify 53 different metabolites. And of those, 21 were significantly different compared to uh, between the PCK rats and the Spragduli controls. And finally, we also used the plasma, which we also took a proton NMR approach, and we were able to confidently identify 53 different metabolites from plasma. And of those 11 were significantly different compared uh, between the PCK animals and the Spragduli controls. But interestingly, when we combine these three platforms, there were five metabolites that remained significant or that were significantly different among the three different platforms. And interestingly, of these five metabolites, four metabolites belong to the TCA site. So this was the first indication that, um, that um, and as I mentioned before, this tissue was collected at day 35. These animals do not reach renal failure until six months of age. So these animals are still at the very early stages of the disease. And so it was very clear that at this point that there are metabolic abnormalities, uh, energetic tissue regulations that present very early on on the disease. And so one thing that I mentioned also before is that the PCK rats um, are a model for a RPKD, which uh, was a pushback somehow. So um, the, the reason why I was using the PCK rat is because PCK rats are, uh, have been a very successful model in preclinical trials, in, for example, uh, with uh, Tobaptan. And um, as you know, the rats are, um, physiologically speaking, closer to humans compared to mice. So I do really, um, unfortunately, we don't have a good model of protologous for ADPKD in rats, but um, the, the, the ARPKD rat has been a very good model to study um, uh, polycystic kinesis in general, because it does really resemble uh, the presentation in humans. Um, having said that, uh, it's still an autologous model for ARPKD. So the next step was to confirm these findings in other platforms to see whether these are specific for ARPKD or PKD or um, what is the situation. So what we did is uh, we also did metabolomics analysis, again, also using proton NMR uh, 
we did this in um, mouse cells. We also did in human cells. And we did in mouse tissue, in this case, uh, in a model or follows for a DPKD. And we also did in a small pilot in human urine at very early stages of the disease. And so interestingly, what we found when we compare all these platforms, what they had in common was that there was an increase in the levels of fumarate, so a consistent elevation of fumarate in these four platforms. So the next question was, um, what could be, or why would be fumarate associated, or what, what could be the role of fumarate? So at that time, I performed a literature search. I was um, not aware that fumarate actually has been previously associated with renal cyst formation. And, and this is the case for fumarate hydrotase deficiency, which has been shown that humans that present a germline mutation in fumarate hydrotase deficiency or in the specific animals that also have been developed to study fumarate hydrotase deficiency present with a renal cyst formation. And as you can see, these are the images from the kidney sections from the fumarate hydrotase deficient mice that do develop progressive cyst formation in their kidneys. So naturally, the next question was to determine how was fumarate hydrotase in our um, polycystic animals kidneys. So uh, to my disappointment at the time, what we found is that there was no difference in the expression of fumarate hydrotase deficiency in uh, the wild that compared to uh, the controls PCK, um, PKD1 animals in this case. And so the next step was to perform an activity assay. And interestingly, what we found there is that the fumarate hydrotase activity was reduced in the PKD animals. And this was correlated with the levels of the kidney tissue fumarate. And so, there were um, no hints or, or why this could be happening in polycystic kidney disease. These are not associated with fumarate hydrotase deficiencies, or at least before. So another, um, and again, I uh, resorted to uh, another literature search. And what I come across is um, um, a paper published from the Sharma group where they did found that uh, fumarate was the one uh, metabolite mediating the effects of that pH oxidase 4 or NOx4 in the diabetic kidney disease. So what they uh, were able to show was that in uh, diabetic kidney disease, there was an increase in NOx4 expression, but that in turn leads to a narrow production of hydrogen peroxide that leads to a potent inhibition of fumarate hydrotase, and in turn, this results in an increase in fumarate. And interestingly, in um, the diabetic kidney disease model, these observations were associated also with mitochondrial abnormalities. So uh, the next step then uh, was to determine how were NOx4 levels in our polycystic animals. So what we found interestingly was that there was an increase or um, um, in, in immunoreactivity in NOx4 in the PCK, these are again back to the PCK animals, uh, compared to the white type controls of four weeks early on. And this uh, became more prominent at two weeks, uh, 12 weeks of age. And so this hints that there is an increase in natural expression with disease progression. And uh, then what we did was um, to determine whether this was uh, also consistent in our PKD1 uh, RCRC model, and we also found in this model that there was an, immune, an increase in neuroactivity in NOx4 at very early stages of the disease. Um, just to briefly mention these animals, the PKD1 RCRC mouse, it's a very slowly progressive model. They do not develop renal failure until approximately 16 months of age. So 12, two months of age, they are cystic. I will show uh, images later on but they are still considered very early stages of the disease. So because of uh, this observed um, increase in NOx4 or expression of very early stages of the disease, this has led to some preclinical trials and we are now um, using um, oligonucleotide antisens anti NOx4 to determine whether there is a decrease in disease progression and so this treatment is blinded. So, but here is a representative image from the two treatment arms. 
where you can see the disease progression in, through imaging in these two um, examples from week two that we administer the vessel up to six months of age. So um, as I mentioned before, uh, in, at least in diabetic kidney disease, these observations of the increase in NOX4 and fumarate were associated with mitochondrial abnormalities. And since also four of the GCA, um, four of the metabolites that we saw that there were significantly different between our PKD models and the wild type controls, we decided to also explore the mitochondria. And we were intrigued by that because there have been um, um, several uh, descriptions about mitochondrial abnormalities. But the problem is that most of the uh, descriptions that have been about mitochondrial abnormalities in uh, ADPKD come from um, the kidneys that have been removed at the time of PSID. So we really wanted to see where at early stages there were um, differences in mitochondria or there were mitochondrial abnormalities. So we studied the, um, uh, the mitochondria using the nephron microscopy, and we did investigate all the different segments of the nephron. And so interestingly, we didn't find any structural abnormalities in the Fox materials, either in the loops of Henley, but we did find structural abnormalities that are characterized by swollen uh, crystal B arrangement in the cells that are lining the microscopy. But also interestingly, what we found was that there was an overall decrease in the mitochondria number per cell. So we not only found uh, this mitochondria structural normality in disease, but overall there was a decrease in mitochondria number. So because the 2D electron microscopy is limited in the amount of information that we can gather from the mitochondria, we are now conducting studies uh, using 3D microscopy. And what we can find is that we not only see the surface area, which is higher in the PKD number, but we are also able to determine that there was a decrease in mitochondria length. These mitochondria that we observe, as you can see here, are more rounded and have higher volumes. But importantly, they have a um, lower mitochondria length. So they, they don't remain with the normal shape of the mitochondria. But uh, one um, problem that we have, as you know, is that we don't have kidney biopsies in uh, early stages of the disease. So the next step is we are trying to determine a way to assess the mitochondria in young patients with ADPKD before there is a deterioration in the renal function. So what we did is a pilot study where we determined mitochondria DNA copy number in urine. And as you can see, these are from patients that uh, the age was average 23 years old. And as you can see from very early stages of the disease, we are um, observing a decrease in mitochondria DNA copy number adjusted by the nuclear DNA. And this was for the two um, reference genes that we picked for the mitochondria. And importantly, this was um, inversely correlated with fat adjusted kidney volume, which means that there could potentially be an association with uh, this severity and mitochondria DNA copy number. So, we are um, this is a pilot study. We are now uh, wrapping up a larger study and we are hoping to have this um, available soon. But we do really think that uh, mitochondria DNA copy number could potentially become an important way of assessing mitochondria uh, content and function from early stages of the disease in patients with ADPKD. So now I uh, I like to quickly go back to my previous slide where I was discussing the association between renal cyst formation and fumarate pyrogase deficiency. So uh, this group. Uh, they performed mechanistic studies to determine where were the um, underlying mechanisms of uh, fumarate pyrogase deficiency and renal cyst formation. And so what they found was that fumarate has the capacity to ablate certain uh, cysteine residues in HIP-1. HIP-1 is the main regulator of uh, NRF2. And so NRF2 is the master regulator of the antioxidant response. So what happens is that under unstress conditions, NRF2 is kept uh, in the cytoplasm uh, by HIP1, 
as you can see in here. And because of that, these target to protosomal degradation. And as a result, the um, antioxidant response is off. However, when there is an increase in reactive oxygen species, or also with the presence of certain metabolites like fumarate, or also in the presence of certain phenolic compounds such as malvary uh, uh, and acid, they also have the capacity to ablate this CC, um, 151 uh, cysteine residues in KIP1. And so what happens is that in that case, an ERF2 is not targeted for protosomal degradation, and instead it does translocate to the nucleus and does turn on the antioxidant response. So the reason why I did mention norovirotic acid before was because I wanted to show you this is an example when we didn't have um, genetic models to study polycystic kidney disease. Um, experimental animals were administered norovirotic acid and they do develop cis formation. And so this was very interesting. So there is an association between phenolic compounds and uh, renal cis formation. And here is just to show you um, our uh, classical renal cis formation in a six month old PKD1 CRC animal, very similar to what is, can be accomplished with the administration of uh, phenolic compounds. So, uh, naturally, the next thing was to determine how was NRF2 expression and immunoreactivity in our very young. Uh, PKD1 or CRC animals, and what we found was that it was an increase in uh, the expression of NRF2 from very early stages of the disease, and also an increase in immunoreactivity in our PKD1 or CRC animals compared to the white hat controls. So, what um, the, the working um, explanation for this is that cells work in an optimal redox environment. And when this happens, there is an equilibrium between apoptosis and cell proliferation. And in that case, the energy response is not activated. And on the other hand, when there is an increase in reactive oxygen species, or when there is an increase in fumarate, this leads to an increase in the energy response. An increase in the inertial response will lead to a reducing environment, but in turn, this reducing environment favors cell proliferation. And this cell proliferation will favor cyst formation, and this will lead to our uh, typical and large polycystic kidneys. When, on the other hand, we do have, for example, a decrease in the inertial response, or that there is an increase in the oxidative. Uh, um, uh, uh, it, it, when there is an, uh, a sudden increase in oxidants, the, the body is not able to um, have this uh, proper energy response. That in turn leads to an uh, oxidative environment as opposed to a reducing environment that will in turn favor apoptosis instead of cell proliferation. And this, in turn, will lead to insufficient inflammation and fibrosis, and what we do see, atrophic polycystic kidneys, and this possibly could result in what we see at later stages of the disease. So our um, ideal will be to find the optimal equilibrium of the optimal redox environment, potentially the optimal energy to level, to get to the point where we have the mild polycystic kidneys and we can slow down the progression of the disease. So right now we are performing longitudinal analysis in the PKD1 or CRC mouse. And as you can see here, we are following these animals with a sequential abdominal MRI from one month to, uh, to renal failure. And we are also collecting sequential urine and blood uh, samples to determine the level of NR2 and different metabolites that we are going to correlate with the findings in the kidney tissue in the hopes that um, the urine and plasma correlates with the findings of the tissue that we could use these urinary and plasma findings um, in the patients with ADPKD where we don't have tissue samples. And so here is um, uh, an example of how uh, our PKD1 or CRC animal looks like at one month of age. And as you can see, 
interestingly, this is similar what we observe in patients, that there is an increase in the TKB during early stages of the disease. But then we observe after six months of age, a plateau in the total kidney volume, and these uh, kidneys, although they are still, of course, large and um, cystic, there is not that much increase in kidney volume, and the kidneys become fatty and more atrophy. And so, uh, finally, the other thing that I wanted to share is some results that we do have for NIH2 activation that we are determining. And so, interestingly, what we are seeing in these animals is that there is an increase in the NIH2 um, activation that happens at very early stages of the disease. And that goes uh, for a fix at around two months of age, which coincides with the highest period of cyst formation in these animals. And interestingly, then there starts to be a decrease in the NF2 response that um, gets to uh, not different from uh, white levels closer to the 12 months of age. So we are also now following a cohort of patients where we are determining the NF2 response at very early stages of the disease, but we are also um, investigating the levels of the NF2 response at more later stages of the disease in these patients with ATPKD. So in summary, uh, for the first part, what we can say is that uh, total kidney volume is a good indicator of uh, at early stages when the GFR remains normal. During later stages of the disease, when the renal function starts to decline, then GFR becomes more informative compared to TKV. And high adjusted TKV and age does predict the future eGFR decline and ESRB in the typical patients, but high adjusted TKV is not really a good predictor in the atypical ADPKD patients. So we do have patients that have class 1A that are the ones that present with very mild disease and are not likely to require therapy or benefit from it. And then we have the more clear cases that are patients in classes 1C to E that have more moderate to severe disease. And those are most likely the ones that benefit from it. Then uh, we have the patients in class 1B that are uh, possibly may benefit from ben, um, initial observation and a treatment maybe at a later date if there is evidence that there is disease progression. From the second part, what we did found was that fumarate was consistently elevated in cells in mice, kidney, mouse kidney and human urine. And we also found that fumarate uh, hydrogase expression was similar in our PKD1 RCRC animals compared to the wild types, but the activity was lower and it was inversely correlated with fumarate um, tissue levels. So uh, these findings, interestingly, were associated with an increase in renal tubular nodes for expression and a decrease in collecting the mitochondria content. We also found that there was a decrease in urinary mitochondrial DNA copy number, and this was adjusted by the nuclear DNA in, and urinary creatinine in young patients with ADPKD. And interestingly, this negatively correlated with the height adjusted TKD. We uh, also found that in PKD1 or CRC, presented with elevated NF2 levels from very early stages of the disease likely decreasing as the disease progresses. And this early amplified NF2 response may be contributing to cell proliferation and cystogenesis in urine um, ADPKD. So as future directions, we are performing um, some, uh, we have in mind uh, preclinical studies in rodents to determine whether NF2 modulators might represent an advantageous therapeutic intervention in ADPKD. We have ongoing, as I mentioned, studies to characterize an actual response in patients with ADPKD. And we also need to determine what are the mechanisms by which NOX4 is upregulated in early ADPKD and what is the interplay between this NOX4 and NF2 and the cellular redox environment 
but importantly, through different stages of the disease. So with that in mind, um, I would like to thank you for um, keeping up uh, with the passive uh, pace of the presentation. Uh, of course, I would like to uh, thank all the members of my lab, all my students and uh, techs and study research coordinators also, uh, my collaborators at Mayo uh, Metabolomics Core, and of course, my colleagues at the Mayo Translational Tutoring Center and my funding. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to share my research with you today. I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Isabel. That was a, an elegant talk and really brought the translational uh, discoveries at the bench and in mice models to a, a human disease that is pretty devastating. And we all look forward to a time when we'd be able to modulate the genetic response. So thank you very much for that uh, uh, beautiful overview and uh, sharing with us your data. Um, at this point, I'll open it up to any questions that the audience may have. Uh, Dr. Fornoni. Thank you, Maria. I want to second what Dr. Weiss said. It's always nice to see translational uh, medicine uh, being performed. Uh, you mentioned the role of the NRF2, and you're probably aware that the FDA last week stopped the development of the Bardoxalon targeting NRF2 in another rare kidney disease, Alport syndrome, and I'm wondering... Uh, whether you can put some thought into that, whether you think it would be a similar outcome in the ongoing uh, trial for PKD? Uh, well, um, I know that in patients with ADPKD, Bardoxalon sh has shown improvement of the EGFR, and that's why the clinical trial was started. Um, I do have the concern that we don't really know how the NRF2 response is at early stages of the disease. That's my main concern. So, and that's why we are trying. So one thing is sometimes we think that ADPKD will be the same at all stages of the disease, but that's not necessarily the case. And so, um, for example, the NRF2 response that may be lower at very late stages may not necessarily be that the case at very early stages of the disease. So as you know, sometimes too much of a good thing is also harmful. And if indeed the NF2 response is lower, we do want to increase it and potentially have a benefit. But I would say we do want to make sure that it's lower before increasing it further. So I do want to really make sure that patients at early stages of the disease do have at least normal levels, but not higher. Because if that is the case, then you don't necessarily want to increase the energy further at early stages. So what I would say is that maybe it's okay, or maybe it's a good therapy for later stages where there is more uh, predominance of fibrosis. That is a constant in our um, animal models and in humans. We know that the TKV doesn't grow, grow, grow indefinitely, there is more predominance of fibrosis at later stages. So at that stage, the NF2 increase could be beneficial. But I do want, and that's why we are actually doing these studies at very early stages of the disease, because what we have seen in animal models and some of the data that we have from patient urine analysis of the NF2 response also it seems to be higher. So I would caution about that that I think it will be important to assess the levels of NRF2 before initiating a therapy. Thank you very much. I want to again thank uh, our sponsors, Drs. Cuneo and Richardson's uh, memory for this memorial lecture. Um, this is our last lecture prior to the new year, so I wish everyone good health. Please be safe and be cautious during your holiday celebrations. As you know, we are experiencing a surge of, of COVID, um, and it's important for us to be very careful as our, um, as our workforce is also getting ill now again. So again, caution, but wishing you good health and happiness. And I also want to acknowledge Dr. Anderson, 
who was a friend of Richardson and donor for the um, for many of the other philanthropic uh, components of our uh, nephrology uh, division. So thank you, everybody. Have a good year, good health, and we'll see you uh, in January. Take care. Thank you, Maria. Thanks. Bye. Bye.